Thanks, Andrew, uh, and thanks, KK. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, down in Washington, DC, uh, giving a uh, presentation um, at one of the regulatory bodies. And uh, I sat down uh, at the panel. And the first thing the uh, um, person who was leading the panel did is it looked at me and said, you dress more like Occupy Wall Street than Wall Street, um, because this is what I wear every single day, which I took as a compliment, um, given what we're trying to, uh, uh, to do, because I think we're entering into a new era. We're entering into an era that I call the era of the non-bank. Um, it's going to be a time where all of us will have the power of a bank, the power of a bank branch, resting in the palm of our hand. And it used to be, not that many years ago, that if you wanted to exchange money in any way, if you wanted to take money and then pay your bills, you went to a bank branch, you deposited your money, and then you wrote out a check. If you had a check and you wanted to deposit it, you went to a bank branch, and then maybe you could use a debit card to make purchases offline or online. But the intermediary was the bank. And the truth of the matter is, in a new model looking forward, it just doesn't have to be that way anymore. Bank branches are going to become obsolete because technology is going to replace them. Digital wallets are really morphing into full service money management and movement tools. You can take a picture of a check with your cell phone and deposit it automatically. There are ways that you can take cash now, and I'll talk about this in a bit, and go to places that you already go to, give that person cash, and it's deposited immediately onto a digital platform. And then right from that digital platform, you can pay your bills. You can send money to somebody else. You can purchase things both online and offline without having to do things like credit checks or any of that kind of thing. So why does this matter? It matters because there are over 2.5 billion people in the world today that live on the margins of our financial system. And I believe that technology can take them from the margins and move them to the mainstream. In fact, I really believe that there's this opportunity to democratize the movement of money. And I want to talk about that. So I talked about uh, 2.5 billion people in the world. There are 70 million people in the United States today that are defined as either unbanked or underbanked. And the official definition of that is somebody that uses an alternative financial service, like a check casher, somebody who pays money orders, does payday loans, that kind of thing, are classified by the FDIC as un- or underbanked. But I think that's a really unfair description to this population. Uh, in fact, the way that I think of this population is really the new middle class. Um, because if you look at people who have an average income of between $50,000 and $150,000 a year, 45% of them spend all or more of their monthly income every single month. Half of Americans today can't come up with $2,000 within 30 days in case of a crisis or an emergency. They truly are living paycheck to paycheck. Many don't have access to credit. Many don't want credit. They've been scarred by the Great Recession. More than 1,800 bank branches have closed in the last couple of years. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So even if you wanted to go to a bank in many areas of the country, you can't access a bank. So people are shut out of the system. Others opt out. And many people who are even in the system are frustrated by the fees that banks are putting that seem to be constantly rising. So you can see in this chart here just how much people are charged for accessing their own hard-earned money. There is such a high cost for exchanging cash from one form to another. So if you don't have a bank and you get paid uh, by your employer and you have a, a check, you go to a cash checking place. And to change that into cash, you can pay anywhere between 2% and 10% 
just to access your own cash. Once you have that cash and you want to pay a bill, let's say it's your cable bill, and you don't have a checking account, you need to stand in line, get a money order, put that money order in the mail, and then mail it off. That money order for a typical $50 cable bill can cost $11 to go and do. So the way that people who don't have access to traditional financial services work is they have to pay usually very high fees and wait in lines. And I spent um, a couple of days trying to experience this. And of course, just spending a couple of days is never enough to really get in the shoes of customers. But what I did find is that the things I took for granted, like just paying an everyday bill, sending money to my daughter who's in college, took so much time. You had to go somewhere, you had to wait in line, then you had to pay a fee. And the whole process seemed to me to be unnecessary given technology today. And what I want to do is share a quick video with you to show you what some people who are un or underbanked or this new middle class feel about the system. where I can pay back my student loans. And that's, that's been scary. It's been almost two years since I have not had a bank account. Now I do construction. Um, you know, I try to get paid in cash. I've stopped banking. I don't have a bank account in my room. I have one box for my checking, and then I have another box for my savings. In New York alone, we have over 800,000 adults that are not banked. Cash and checks, paying bills, money transfers. It's expensive to not have a bank account because everything else that the rest of us do for free costs money. I've got a lot of friends who don't qualify for credit cards. They have no way of depositing their checks or making their bills. I definitely think that my generation can use help in managing their money. It's like a part-time job arranging around not having a simple thing as a card. People don't realize how easy they have it. I have to find a, a middleman to help me with my, my, my system of living. People look at you and they go, what the heck is wrong with you? You don't have a bank account. You need to push past this question of, well, they don't have a lot of money, or they don't save money, or they don't really understand how banks work, because none of those things are true. I just want what everyone wants, you know, in the traditional scheme of things. I want to be financially secure. I want to be in charge of my money, and I want to be debt free. I spend money just like everybody else. I'm just not sliding plastic in now. I'm spending cash because that's what I have to, that's the way I have to do it. Life is going to get crazier and crazier and busier and busier, and then my money is going to have more avenues to go through. There are times I wish I had that savings account. There are times I wish I could, you know, go in and talk to somebody about retirement. When you talk about connecting to these populations and thinking about how many people are out there disconnected and yet spending money on financial services, I think the profit motive and the, and the, the capitalist structure should work perfectly. Do we really want their business? Yes, you want their business. They just spent $19 million in the Bronx uh, on check cashers. My hopes for the future is to find a system that will make having money a lot simpler. So if I could have anything, I would want to have an app on my phone that I could pay my bills online, direct deposit for other people's accounts, and put my checks into. I've got a lot of friends that, that would help. Financial empowerment is really the antidote, the key, the super vitamin to how it is we make smart, efficient investments in getting people on their feet in a more holistic financial way. Being able to have an account, to have access to the card, just slide that card in and take care of things, it would feel like a privilege. I would feel human again. I would feel like I've, I've been saved. I think that's a powerful, uh, moving, and for me, an inspiring uh, video. You know, underserved customers want what all of us want. They want to easily access cash. They want to keep their money safe. They want to pay their everyday bills. They want to save for the future. And most importantly, they want to be treated with respect. And uh, most people go, well, why would you go to some of these places? 
really, the people who go to these places, the population, are very thoughtful about what they're doing, about the services they use. They understand that they're paying high fees. And why are they doing that? Because there aren't better alternatives. So solving for financial inclusion is incredibly complex. There are more regulatory issues than you can possibly imagine uh, around this. Um, and when I first came to American Express, and my background is uh, a couple of startups uh, that I had done beforehand, and, and I was coming there to try and do change in a large financial institution, and somebody told me, look, change doesn't happen very quickly in financial services. If you think about it, you're used to software and things happening in quarters. In financial services, they happen in sort of millennium, at sort of a thousand year blocks. Cash has been around forever. Um, and it isn't just that things move slowly and it's very complex, but money is very personal. It's personal to all of us. And there's not a lot of tolerance for trying new things. People want to make sure that their money is safe, that it's secure, that it's easy to get to, because you need your money to live your life. So it was interesting as I went back in this, changing behavior is really hard. The first ATM that we now take for granted was put out into the market by, uh, by Chemical Bank in 1969. And they put out a, uh, an ad that said, starting tomorrow morning, Chemical Bank will never close. Um, and there they were, ATMs sat around, basically unused for a decade. It wasn't until the 1980s that people started to feel comfortable with it. And you know, it may have seemed obvious to the technologists that put the ATM out that it was going to be more convenient, easier to use. But better does not always imply trusted. And that's very important when moving and managing your money. The other thing is underbanked. There's a lot of myths about the underbanked. And they're often treated like second class citizens. One myth is that underbanks don't make good, solid financial decisions, that they don't really understand that there are other alternatives. The truth of the matter is, is that companies and banks and financial services, they aren't offering the right things that these populations need, like instantaneous access to their cash, personalized advice, that kind of thing. So, and many of the banks are acting actually rationally. Given their infrastructure, they can't afford to serve certain populations. So I'll talk about that in a second. The other myth is that the underbanked don't really have a meaningful impact in our economy. That's completely wrong. They spend, in the United States, $1.3 trillion in spend in the US. And imagine if we could take some of that $78 billion that they spend in interest and fees every single year. By the way, $30 billion in bounce check fees uh, each year. And if we took some of that, put it back into the economy, generated jobs, generated local communities that could use that investment coming back. These myths lock people out of the financial system. As I said, banks actually make rational decisions. For a bank branch, you need approximately $30 million of deposits for that to be profitable. In a low interest rate environment, I, my prediction is you're not just going to have 1,800 banks closed. You're going to have a lot more, because somewhere around a third of all bank branches are unprofitable. And it, so it isn't the fault of a branch. It's just an antiquated infrastructure that can't deal with the realities of today's environment. So the financial system is outdated. And bank accounts are often the key to people getting credit. And if you can't get credit, you go to things like payday uh, lenders. And I'm sure you've all heard about the sometimes triple digit interest rates that can occur if somebody takes out a payday loan. If you don't pay that back, many studies have shown it can be 6% of the income of a lower income uh, uh, individual. So the long-term impacts is you can't get loans, you can't buy cars, you can't get housing. Those kinds of things are very difficult and make a big difference in our economy. 
But I don't think that the cycle has to continue this way. The answer isn't banking the unbanked. That, that's not what I, th what I think it is. I think it's thinking about it differently. I think it's using technology to breathe life into the words financial inclusion. And part of my job is meeting with a lot of startups and a lot of innovative companies who are looking at financial services in different ways. And I want to kind of walk through uh, two or three uh, examples that, just so you know, we have not invested in. Uh, but these are just companies that I think have a really interesting way of approaching financial systems. There's a company in Boston called Signify. And what Signify does is it looks actually at your mobile phone patterns to give you a credit score. What they've done is a, is a very sophisticated algorithm that they've tested on some three million people. And by looking at the time of day when somebody calls, how often they call during different time segments, how long those calls are, they can give, within, after 30 days, a numeric score in terms of credit quality for that individual. It's very different than what typically you would associate with credit bureaus. Juntos uh, is a US startup um, that basically is a, sort of this combination between sort of mint.com and Weight Watchers um, is the way that I think about it. Um, it's basically for people who don't have access to a smart uh, phone or necessarily to a PC but have a feature phone which can do text messaging. And basically, every time you do a spend, you quickly text message uh, to Juntos uh, kind of the amount and where you spent. And then at the end of the month, they mail you, or they can give it to you online, actually a, a categorization of your spend. So for the first time, you can actually see a budget for where did your spend go each and every month, and then they can set goals and that kind of thing. Very interesting uh, startup. And then, one other example, in India, um, India, the post office outnumbers bank branches 17 to 1. And, and they're in most of the rural areas. And what basically um, the government has done is they've assigned bank correspondence status to post office so that people can go into the post office, give cash. That cash then is put onto a digital wallet. People can then pay bills or send money to somebody else in another town. Those other people can walk into the post office, kind of show uh, that the money has been texted to them, and then withdraw cash straight from the post office. And by the way, there are similar models occurring here in the US. A number of retailers are allowing consumers to come in, give cash to the cashier, and that cash is then automatically put onto a digital account. And from that digital account, you can pay your bills, et cetera. It's basically utilizing infrastructure where cashiers become the moral equivalent of bank tellers. Um, and that transfer of cash straight into a digital account is where people already are. It's more convenient than going to a branch. There's really no need to go to a branch anymore if you can start to do these kinds of things. And the heart of these ideas are using technology to add value to the way that you manage and move your money. So I started American Express three years ago. And my remit was basically look for opportunities outside of charging credit. But what I didn't realize is when I first started there um, is that we actually could start to think about using technology to breathe life into financial inclusion. And what rapidly became you know, our vision was to explode the paradigm that it has to be expensive to be poor. I don't know if, if you've heard that, but it's true in many statements. Ironically, the less money you have, the more it costs you to manage and move it. And with technology, that just doesn't need to be the case anymore. Managing and moving your money should be a right and not a privilege. So there's no question that change is going to sweep through the financial industry. Financial industry is no different than other industries where technology is touched down. The technology is like this digital tornado. It touches down. It sort of sucks up <laughs> traditional industry, spits it out. New business models arise. And the real question 
for all of us to wrestle with is how do we use technology to solve financial inclusion? Financial exclusion is a huge problem in our world. And there are so many problems in our world that seem to be intractable. But this one doesn't have to be. The real question is, how do we wrestle with the things that technology can do and can't do? What do we think about in terms of the regulatory bodies across the world? Can NGOs step in and help? How do we think about changing consumer behavior, and what does it take to go and do that? And so I hope that um, this can be sort of the start of a conversation uh, with many of you in the room in trying to figure out how do we, once and for all, try to solve some of the issues of financial inclusion. Thank you.